So today, as we celebrate the Global Leadership Initiative and the accomplishments of its student fellows, I am pleased to introduce the president of the University of Montana, Dr. Royce Ingstrom, one of the strongest proponents of this relatively new program. When President Ingstrom arrived at UM as provost, he immediately met with faculty governance groups on campus and suggested that we needed to think about how to strengthen the curriculum with a focus on big questions for the global century. His vision, coupled with the conceptual work, planning, and the efforts of faculty, created opportunities for students to enter into an exciting and promising new program known as the GLI. President Ingstrom is committed to preparing our students for a life of unprecedented volatility, to give them the skills to address global issues, and to help them communicate across borders and cultures. Throughout his career, President Ingstrom has been involved in undergraduate research, first as a student majoring in chemistry, then as a faculty mentor helping students perform and conduct laboratory research, and more recently as an administrator working to build programs that challenge undergraduates to address big questions and global issues. He has embraced a transformative approach in which students are actively engaged in experimental learning, a hallmark of the GLI program. His support has allowed students from diverse backgrounds and from across the entire campus to make deliberate choices about their education while clarifying how their majors offer ways to tackle global problems. I give you President Royce Engstrom, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Arlene. Good evening, everyone. I know that most of you were just in the other room, but for those of you who may have just uh, come in for the lecture, I want to uh, tell you that we had just a wonderful ceremony in the previous hour recognizing our Global Leadership Initiative students and giving them their symbolic uh, passport, turning them loose on the world uh, as they go off onto the next component of the Global Leadership Initiative program. I want to say thank you again to all people who have had something to do with the program, certainly those intrepid students who have uh, taken on the challenge of the Global Leadership Initiative in its early years, the faculty members who conceptualized the program and who are now implementing the program, and the staff and administrators that support the program uh, with the work behind the scenes. And again, I want to thank, uh, with a special thanks, those people, many of whom are in the room, who have given financially to this program to make sure that it gets off to a strong start. Uh, if it were not for your contributions and your donations, uh, the GLI would not be able to grow the way it has already. And so thank you uh, so much for the dedication and uh, the vision that you have as uh, individuals. It is a pleasure to have accompany that passport ceremony with a stimulating lecture uh, for the Global Leadership Initiative, and I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Stanley Katz. I had the chance to meet with uh, Professor Katz this morning and found him just delightful, and I think he's exactly the right speaker and the right topic for the Global Leadership Initiative event this year. Stanley Katz is, pr is President Emeritus of the American Council of Learned Societies, the national humanities organization in the United States. Mr. Katz graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University in 1955 with a major in English history and literature. He was trained in British and American history at Harvard, PhD in 1961, where he also attended law school in 1969 and 70. His recent research focuses upon contemporary developments in American philanthropy, a very appropriate topic for tonight's uh, GLI ceremony the relationship of civil society and constitutionalism to democracy, and upon the relationship of the United States to the international human rights regime. He writes about higher education policy, and he has published a blog for the Chronicle of Higher Education. 
Dr. Katz is a fellow of the American Society for Legal History, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Society of American Historians, and a corresponding member of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He received the annual Fellows Award from Phi Beta Kappa in 2010 and the National Humanities Medal awarded by President Obama in 2011. He is currently a professor in public and international affairs at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And he is the director of the Princeton University Center for Arts and Cultural Policy Studies. Tonight, Dr. Katz will discuss with us the difficulty that American universities have experienced in moving from international education to global education. His concern is that in preparing undergraduate students for global citizenship, we have to move beyond the traditional focus on language study, study abroad, and area studies. All of those remain essential parts of a broader global education, but we'll need to do much more given the interconnectedness of our current world. Again, a perfect topic for the Global Leadership Initiative. Would you join me in welcoming Professor Stanley Katz? Thanks so much, President Engstrom, and everybody else I met today. I met almost all the faculty members and administrators at this university today. I don't remember any of your names, but I will over a period of time. It really was, has been a wonderful visit. Uh, the last time I was here was I think about 25 years ago and I promised that I would be back soon with my wife and go driving around. That hasn't happened, but now I'll promise it again and this time it will happen. You're so lucky to be not only at a great university, and it is a great university, but to live in such a gloriously gorgeous place. And it's been two beautiful days while I was here. So I can only imagine what it's like to live here. Although I suppose there are times of year when it's not as easy to get along as it has been the last couple of days. So uh, President Engstrom has already told you what I'm going to tell you, and I'll, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, I was looking at the local papers, I, I always do. I was amazed, by the way, at the amount of advertising that was done for this lecture. That's great. Um, and I noticed some sort of appropriate things in the Missoulian. Um, yesterday, there was uh, an editorial about give local, support Missoula nonprofits. And that reminded me of the emphasis that I have in my own work. And I think that the GLI has on service. Uh, but it also reminded me that I'm in a particular part of the world. There was an article in the paper also that says, Museum in Cody, Wyoming, acquires Lone Ranger's pistol. <laughs> that, a wonderful news story. So it's, it's great to be here in the real United States. Uh, but you know, uh, also in the news, there's been a lot of attention recently to the problems of globalism and the role of the United States in the world. This is a particularly conflicted moment, I think, for the United States. Uh, we, as you know, emerged as uh, a superpower after World War II. Uh, we've had a uh, somewhat troubled career as a superpower since that time. Uh, our situation changed a lot after 1989 and the fall of the wall in Berlin and the uh, emergence of a new sort of system of power relationships in the world. For a long time, it looked as though we were the sole superpower in the world. That's not so clear anymore. But what has been clear is that it had been difficult for Americans to reconceptualize uh, their role in the world, their relationship to other countries and other areas uh, of the world. Uh, a lot of ways to uh, think about all of this. I was struck, by the way, by the reports on uh, Mrs. Obama's uh, trip to China. She took her two daughters, as you probably remember, to, uh, to Beijing during their spring vacation a few weeks ago. And while she was there, she gave uh, a couple of interviews uh, and uh, extolling the idea that more American students should get abroad. And she lamented the fact that there were more than 100,000 Chinese students 
uh, in the United States and only uh, fewer than 20,000 uh, Americans in, in China. Uh, but she was very uh, forceful in advocating more study abroad uh, for Americans. Uh, but she said, of course, that there was a problem because uh, here she was in China. Um, and uh, the United States, she said, respected the uniqueness of other cultures and societies. But when it comes to expressing yourself freely uh, and uh, worshiping as you choose uh, and uh, having open access to information, we believe those are universal rights that are the birthright of every person on this planet. Now, I'm not going to give a lecture on this subject, but there's a built-in tension here which this program uh, is about. That is to say, on the one hand, uh, we have an assertion of universality. Um, the rights of free speech and free wor worship, Mrs. Obama said, ought to be the same everywhere in the world. But she was in a country where they're not, um, and where the government of that country doesn't believe those rights exist, really. Uh, how to deal with that is a difficult problem, and it's a problem, I think, both of globalism, uh, the universality of rights, uh, and of uh, internationalism, the relations between two great nations, China and the United States. I could obviously say more about that, but I was really struck um, by that. So every time you read the newspaper, you will see uh, articles of just that kind that remind you how important all of this is. Uh, the Washington Post um, had an editorial uh, just the other day when I was uh, traveling, and uh, its headline was, America's global role deserves better support from President Obama. For seven decades uh, since the end of World War II, uh, the United States uh, has, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I can't read my own handwriting, <laughs> uh, has shouldered the responsibility uh, for uh, global uh, security uh, guarantees. New polls show that 47% of Americans want the uh, United States to be le less active in world affairs, uh, a 33% uh, increase since 2001, since the events of 2001. So, you know, we live in a world where it's not so clear, uh, where we fit, uh, how we ought to relate to others, and it seems to me crucial that an institution such as this, located in the middle of the United States, in the middle of the continent, uh, retain its commitment to being a truly global and international institution, and that you, the students of this institution, uh, begin to understand what that means in terms of both your responsibilities, but also your opportunities to become truly global and international uh, students. So. Uh, tonight, I want to consider uh, what we need to do to provide a genuinely global and international education, uh, particularly for undergraduate students at a place like this. And so I want to begin by discussing the question of what we mean uh, when we use the terms globalization and internationalization. First, what is the difference, if any, between international and global? The terms are frequently used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be confused. Uh, Philip Altblock, uh, one of the leading scholars of higher education, has remarked that, quote, globalization may be unalterable, but internationalization involves many choices. And that's a good start. Uh, crudely, global means concerning the whole world. Global phenomena are those not limited to particular places. Most importantly, from this perspective, uh, global phenomena impact the entire world. Climate change would be the most obvious concrete example. International, on the other hand, means just what the compound word implies, something that transcends the nation state uh, existing or occurring across borders. Trade or athletic contests between nations are good examples. For education, perhaps the most difficult challenge uh, is to globalize the curriculum. It's hard to know precisely what that might involve, but I suppose at the very least it means to expose students to the range of global phenomena that we are finally aware of, both in the present world and historically. And it means to explore the ways in which global phenomena impact just about everything we do nationally. Uh, it means enabling our students 
to imagine uh, the global implications of everything. There are exciting possibilities for reconceptualizing curricula globally, though I don't think there are currently very many good examples of what we might do uh, in undergraduate education, which is one of the reasons I'm so interested in what's going on here. One of the most ambitious approaches I've encountered recently was put forward a year ago in an AACNU publication by an international group of liberal arts college presidents. Uh, they call their approach an education for the stewardship of the global commons. I quote, we believe it is important to imagine an education fit for global possibilities, whereas higher education used to be framed in purely national terms. An appropriate university education for everyone, not just a privileged elite, must prepare women and men for participation uh, in these global cultures and this commons. The purpose of a 21st century education is to produce graduates who recognize themselves to be of the world and who also assume responsibility for the world. Their proposed curriculum would require students to acquire what they call a range of literacies, skills, and dispositions for global engagement. And they include respect, vulnerability, hospitality, compassion, agency, agility, fairness, service, and leadership. This is a huge agenda, and it would require a university and its faculty to buy into a series of norms that are currently not very widely held in any university. And I don't think most institutions are prepared to make such a leap. But we've only been thinking globally for a relatively short period of time whereas we have been thinking internationally for at least the last 300 years of Western history. We ought to be prepared to undertake the task of internationalization now. That's the easier one. The challenge of internationalizing the curriculum is to transcend the underlying nationalism that inspired the growth of the modern university starting in the 18th century and in Germany. At one level, this simply requires us to understand the extent to which phenomena are transacted across borders or take place simultaneously in different places. But at a more profound level, internationalizing challenges us to think extranationally, to see ourselves as involved in decisions and processes that cannot be understood on a purely national basis. And all the while, as educators and political animals, we have to keep reminding ourselves that although we must think globally, we ordinarily have to act nationally and locally. This is as true for globalism as it is for internationalism. Every global phenomenon occurs in some particular place. So much for philosophy, but I wanted to put these distinctions on the table so that we could keep them in mind. Now perhaps the most compelling reason for encouraging undergraduates to think internationally is that this will enable them, to enable them to situate themselves more adequately in their own lives. And two of America's best known economists made just that argument uh, about 20 years ago when they were asked why international perspectives were important in the teaching of economics. My co colleague Paul Krugman responded, the problem is that most of what a student is likely to read or hear about international economics is nonsense. The most important thing to teach our undergrads about trade is how to detect that nonsense. <laughs> our primary mission should be to vaccinate the minds of our undergraduates against the misconceptions that are so predominant in what passes for educated discussion about international trade. It's a wonderful metaphor for education. Paul seems to be saying that forcing undergraduates to evaluate international arguments enables them to develop intellectual BS detectors. <laughs> and that would be a good thing for a number of subjects. Perhaps more helpfully, my former colleague, uh, Joe Stiglitz, argued that it is important for students to have an, uh, quote, international perspective to put the kinds of statistics with which they are confronted into perspective. We often take our economic and social institutions for granted. By taking an international perspective, students can come to understand that there are differences and similarities across economies. Now, this is simply to say that by studying the other, we can get a fix on ourselves. 
An international approach gives us a perspective on the national, regional, and local. It constitutes the beginning, at least, for students of an intellectual GPS. Most observers contend that the emergence of the Cold War in the 1950s stimulated the creation of international programs in American universities, and I think that's true. It was a partly a question of knowing your enemy, and partly a question of knowing the terrain on which the Cold War was being fought, mostly, of course, in the developing world. But the result was an influx of both government and philanthropic funds for the creation of a wide variety of international programs. The federal government was especially interested in funding foreign language programs with an emphasis on non-Western languages. Both the government and private funders, particularly the Ford Foundation, were also concerned to support area studies, scholarship on the government, economy, and society of foreign nations and regions, again, especially those behind the Iron Curtain and in what was then called the Third World. Russian language and Soviet studies flourished on American campuses in response to this funding, but so did a scholarship and teaching concerning most of what had earlier been considered the remote parts of the world. The curricula of pre-World War II U.S. higher education had been primarily oriented to our own continental island and to the European nations from which most white Americans had emigrated. This new support after the war for the study of foreign language and areas gave rise to a broad range of expertise, some domestic and some imported on our campuses. And it gave American undergraduates intellectual exposure to both parts of the world and to ways of life they had not previously encountered. In general, the curriculum came to include a much broader range of international content than traditional liberal arts education had provided before 1945. Our universities also began to encourage Americans to travel abroad and to study in foreign nations, either in local universities or in special programs for Americans established abroad. Indeed, many U.S. universities established campuses outside the United States, whereas wealthy undergraduates had for many years taken what was called the Grand Tour of Europe. A broader range of American students now traveled much more internationally and incorporated formal education more fully into their travel. Here, too, government funding proved helpful. The Fulbright program was the biggest of these programs, and it was inaugurated in 1948, sending American undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty for year-long stays in countries around the world. By the 1960s, the trend was accelerated by the creation of the Peace Corps, which attracted American college graduates for life-changing experiences in formerly remote, spa, remote parts of the world, and then returned them uh, to American campuses for graduate work. Private funders also created fellowships and scholarships for foreign study, sending many young Americans for postgraduate work. And the number of foreign students, mostly graduate students, enrolled in our universities expanded exponentially, thereby further internationalizing our domestic campuses adding to the enrichment already being created by the recruitment of foreign faculty members. But what had begun as an exercise in national security preparedness became, over the decades, a program of internationalization of the educational experience of U.S. undergraduates. Whereas many universities and liberal arts colleges had long required the study of, quote, Western civilization, now campuses began to require either world civilization or the study of particular non-Western civilizations in order to broaden the intellectual out outlook of their undergraduates. This trend certainly had something to do with the ongoing stresses of the Cold War, but also responded to the dynamics of post-colonialism as the old European empires fell apart and new nations came into existence in the 1960s. As a nation, Americans still traveled less and spoke fewer foreign languages than citizens of many other nations. But we were steadily becoming more cosmopolitan and less provincial than the nation in which our parents had been educated. There had always been a tension, mainly hidden on the campus, of education in the name of defense against formal foreign evil doing, the evil empire. But most students perceived only the more positive 
one world message of internationalization. The positive message was enhanced by the growing economic strength of the United States and the rapidly expanding foreign and international business opportunities for our students. More students were studying foreign languages to increase their employability than because of their concern for the political, social, and economic welfare of those living abroad. The problem, however, was that the positive intellectual impetus for international studies provided by the Cold War began to dissipate by the 1980s. And a reaction against internationalism began to rear its head. Attitudes that verged on xenophobia began to emerge in this country in response to the Vietnam War and during the culture wars of the late 1980s and early 1990s and reached a dangerous level in the reaction to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. For me, the most disturbing reaction to that tragic event was that of Lynn Cheney, the wife of the then Vice President of the United States, Richard Cheney, and herself, the former chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, who less than a month after 9-11 said, uh, who insisted, I said, that calls for more intensive study of the rest of the world amounted to blaming America's failure to understand Islam for the attack on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. And in a letter distributed by an organization she had created, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, chastised professors who failed to teach the truth that civilization itself is best exemplified in the West and indeed in America. It's not the sort of sentiment that would have been uttered uh, shortly before that time. Cheney's was among the most extreme reactions against the study of foreign culture, but she was not alone in her concern. One scholar of international education has commented that by the late 1980s, conservative educators became alarmed that the international programs of the liberal 1970s would weaken America's position in the world because students were being exposed to a subjective approach to policies and relationships with other countries based on feelings and attitudes which either bend to the will of other nations or which value victim cultures and downgrade America. It's a quote. These educators maintain that the curriculum should focus on American cultural values and on Western civilization as the purveyor of progress in the world. There's a strong reassertion of that point of view. But this scholar points to a more, even more serious problem that was emerging for the curriculum in the 1990s. Faculty had been urging students to enroll in courses in foreign languages, area studies, and international relations. But she says, evidence remains that they did not internationalize the curriculum, that is, these same educators. Instead, they created structures, research centers. The structures came into being because they were supported by grants from government, foundations, and other private sources. And of course, these structures serve primarily the interest of faculty, not of students. So we invested in research structures, not in uh, undergraduate education. Uh, that's to say that external funding enabled area studies scholars to establish centers, institutes, and the like that were primarily research oriented. They did not expend their time and energy in reconceptualizing the undergraduate curriculum to reflect their internationalism and, uh, and focusing uh, on graduate training rather than undergraduate education. The result was that when both federal government and foundation funding for area studies diminished or nearly disappeared by the mid-1990s, the area studies centers declined or crumbled and left only a small imprint on undergraduate, uh, on the undergraduate curriculum. The result has been that the, that portion of internationalization that drew its strength from faculty research in other parts of the world has declined significantly over the course of the last generation. But nevertheless, there is no doubt that a significant proportion of the faculty, a proportion substantially larger than a generation ago, is still studying places and topics that are accurately described as foreign or international. All of the international programs that originated or grew during the Cold War period continue to play a role on our campuses, foreign language study, study abroad, uh, the internationalization of campus human resources and the like. 
So why, if this is so, should I worry about the state of internationalization uh, and the possibilities for globalism in our universities? Basically, I worry that the project of internationalization as an educational strategy has failed, has, sorry, has stalled. Some of the uh, underlying, na bad mistake, <laughs> national problems with uh, curricular internationalization have been slow to disappear or be mitigated. First among them is American parochialism. We have improved, but Americans still command too few foreign languages and live and study abroad too infrequently. Our news media pay too little attention to the world outside our borders. We're infrequently, we're too infrequently interested in the rest of the world, and despite the, the ceremony some of us saw just before, too few of us have passports. Uh, for the 2010, the best estimate is that 46% of Americans hold passports, and you might be interested to know that 40% of Montanans hold passports. That's a low number, actually, by comparison to other countries uh, in the world, and it's a source, I think, of some real concern. This parochialism not only limits the knowledge and skills available to American faculty and students, but more importantly, shapes faculty attitudes. My question is, how important most letters and sciences faculty consider the internationalization of the curriculum? And I don't think that's clear. I don't know the answer to the question, but I fear that in the social sciences, which during the Cold War era were the bulwark of international studies in this country, fewer and fewer faculty are concerned. And the reason seems clear. For at least a decade, social scientists have been moving in the direction of what they call uh, pure science, um, aspiring to establish uh, high-level conceptual hypotheses through complex mathematical and formal models. The rewards in economics, political science, and other social science fields are for those who are most adept at abstract conceptualization and the most sophisticated manipulation of data. In economics, Paul Krugman described the trend as favoring beauty clad in impressive looking mathematics, his words, over truth, the establishment of empirical understanding of the real world. Now, Krugman noted that, quote, the central cause of the profession's failure, economics, was the desire for an all-encompassing, intellectually elegant approach. And this has meant in practice that an economist or political scientist finds it hard or impossible to gain tenure for her knowledge of the Japanese economy or of the Kenyan political system. Purporting to establish universal propositions is what gets you jobs and promotions. Young scholars understand this perfectly. It means that they have fewer incentives to learn new languages, travel globally, or build research networks in the developing world. And this seems to be the case uh, both at a place like Princeton, where I teach, and at a place like the University of Montana, where you are. Who then will be the area studies scholars and uh, undergraduate teachers of the next generation? It's a serious problem. And there was an article in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education just a couple of days ago, which is entitled, Attention on Crimea Highlights Flux in Russian Studies. There are some Russian studies scholars uh, here. And what it points out, of course, is that when the uh, Crimean crisis hit and continues, of course, in Ukraine, there are fewer and fewer uh, specialists on that region, um, and people who speak Ukrainian and or Russian, who are available to comment and who are deeply connected to the region and upon whom we can rely for, uh, for expertise. Um, they quote a number of people here saying the kinds of things I just said to you, and they point out uh, Ohio State is a place where they interview people that uh, Ohio State used to have eight uh, uh, Russian specialists on the faculty, they now have three. And this is one of the largest universities in the United States and one of the great uh, foreign studies universities in the United States. And the funding environment for international research has also deteriorated very badly. Federal programs such as Title VI and Title VIII have been cut back substantially. The Fulbright program is being funded at much lower levels, and in fact there's a threat right now of a 30% cut. Uh, this year to the Fulbright uh, program. NEH funding uh, has taken a series of hits, 
and there are an increasing number of attacks on National Science Foundation social science funding, which itself looks to be declining dramatically. And the same is true in the private sector. For decades, the Ford Foundation, until recently the country's largest uh, private philanthropic foundation, was the principal supporter of area studies research. But Ford began to withdraw from its commitment to area studies in the early 1990s. Ford has now almost no presence in the field, and there are few large private funders who fund international research in our universities. Uh, an example would be the Gates Foundation, now by far the largest of the philanthropic foundations. It has shown almost no interest in area studies, although it has a massive programmatic commitment to the development, developing world. And of course, they're interested in research in vaccines and other things, but not in the areas uh, where they're actually working. The net result has been that American universities have been forced to draw on their internal resources and their institutional fundraising capacity to support international programs. Quite a few universities have responded uh, positively to the challenge, but many others have lacked either the will or the capacity to respond. And that is probably the case here in Montana, although I don't know that. On the research side, we seem to be witnessing a concentration of internationalization in a relatively small number of well-endowed institutions. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. As a consequence, the Montanas of the nation will find it hard, if not impossible, to keep up with the Stanfords, Harvards, and Michigans, the institutions that have the kinds of resources they can pour into these efforts. It can be very difficult for smaller, smaller institutions to do that. Nevertheless, all American universities want to globalize and internationalize, although, as I've always said, they mean very different things um, by both globalization and internationalization. They've put into place a large number of programs, recruited staff, and have redirected their foreign relationships in the cause of globalization and internationalizing. The institutional measure of success for each university will be in relationship to the goals that it has specified. And I don't have any trouble with this sort of diversity in approach. My concern is for what globalization and internationalization mean for the, under, the education of our undergraduate arts and sciences students. I don't think an educator ought to be indifferent to the question of what specific learning outcomes we seek for the international education of our undergraduates. And that's, I think, what the GLI is trying to cope with uh, right now. Since I believe very strongly that the overall goal should be those of liberal education, and for that I'll just use the AACNU definition, a philosophy of education that empowers individuals with broad knowledge and transferable skills and a strong sense of value, ethics, and civic engagement, liberal learning is characterized by challenging encounters with important issues and more a way of studying than a specific course or field of study. You've heard other definitions of that kind. Uh, one thing, by the way, that gets left out of the AACNU definition, I, I want to just mention because I think it's really important, and that's jobs. What is the relationship? We have to confront that. What is the relationship between globalization, internationalization, and job preparation? Uh, of course, many institutions and many individuals think they ought to be not only on the list, but they ought to lead the list. Only a few years ago, in 2009, Martha Cantor, then the Federal Undersecretary of Education for Higher Education, told an audience at a meeting uh, that international education cannot be seen as an add-on. The skills and knowledge acquired in international education are the same skills graduates need to succeed in the economy. And at that same meeting, the president of SUNY, the State University of New York, urged the audience to implement international education programs on their campuses. She contended that universities' international work has to be done in the context of trade and immigration policy. Now, I don't agree with either Under Secretary Cantor or President Zimfer. Uh, if what they mean is that the skills acquired in a liberal education will prove useful for lifelong employment, but if what they mean is that undergraduates should primarily learn skills that are immediately and specifically employment related, that is to say, are the skills you need for your first job, I disagree strongly. 
uh, and I could talk about that at some length. But there is a tremendous emphasis on exactly that, particularly now coming from the Obama administration. Uh, it has become a more insistent refrain, not only from uh, Washington, but from other places since the recession of 2007 to 2009. Um, and, of course, what many students and their parents quite understandably are concerned about is employability. The point is that in these days of high unemployment, even for college graduates, universities feel compelled to stress the narrowest utilitarian goals of higher education. And this is, I think, just what is being um, advocated by uh, President Obama and Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan. There's nothing wrong with job preparedness. It's essential, but it should not be the primary goal of higher education. I think that it is wrong, disappointing, and dangerous to think otherwise. It represents a dead-end road for undergraduates' arts and sciences education, which should be defended on much broader utilitarian premises, nothing wrong with utilitarian premises, articulated long ago by John Dewey. The acceleration of education, Dewey said, depends upon men consciously trying to, to uh, educate their successors, not for the existing state of affairs, but so as to make possible a future better humanity. But there's a great difficulty here. Each generation is inclined to educate its young so as to get along in the present world instead of with a view to the proper end of education, which is the promotion of the best possible realization of humanity as humanity. That's the end of the quote. And I think Dewey is right. If we think that the aim of undergraduate education is getting along in the world today, uh, then the larger project of liberal education is at risk. Liberal education is about learning, not skilling. It is about tomorrow, not today. My task, therefore, is to convince you that the proper end of undergraduate liberal education is to form the habits of mind required by democratic citizenship. This involves skills acquisition, but the skills required are those of critical thinking, the identification of values, and the contextualization of the role of the individual in relation to his or her role in society. To put this in Paul Krugman's terms, education should not be a beauty contest. It should be training in how to speak truth to power. By this time, I can understand if you wonder whether I have any practical advice as to how we should uh, go about globalizing and internationalizing. Uh, and that's a hard question to answer. I'm not going to presume to do it. I'm in favor of nearly all the measures that universities have taken to internationalize their undergraduate education, courses with international and foreign content, programs devoted to studying foreign areas and international processes, uh, study and other learning experiences abroad, the international diversification of students and faculty, and more. But my feeling is that in themselves, these discrete efforts at internationalizing and the many fewer efforts at globalizing are not enough. They do not necessarily accumulate to constitute an internationalized undergraduate education. They have little to do with uh, comprehending the implication of uh, uh, globalization. Too frequently our mistake is to think that by establishing and funding discrete international programs, we have globalized undergraduate education, but we have not. These programs are only educationally useful measures if they are done well and if they relate to one another in a curricular and pedagogically meaningful manner. Each of the international aspects of an undergraduate's learning experience should contrib contribute in an intentional manner to his or her cognitive development, contributing to the learning outcomes that further liberal education. Most of our educational programs for undergraduates focus on content, as they should, but their long-term impact, if any, will be less uh, in the specific content contained than in the habits of mind formed. We now know from cognitive psychologists that the best approach to cognitive development is the facilitation of active learning. When applied to internationalizing undergraduate education, active learning requires creating opportunities for our students to learn for themselves, setting them challenges and encouraging them to take risks. I think it is relatively easy to see how we can do that 
in particular settings like academic courses and study abroad experiences, although most academic experiences are far from reaching this ideal, ideal, and too much study abroad is more like tourism than education. The larger problem is how to integrate active learning across the discrete, discrete experiences. How does study abroad interdigitate with on-campus academic work? How do we build on-campus support for what has been learned abroad? How can students be helped to integrate their cognitive experiences to accumulate in a truly internationalized educational experience? This is the capstone experiences that the GLI is trying to provide. You know, how can we sensitize students to the global implication of even uh, everyday and local events? Hannah Arendt put her finger on the problem when she commented that the problem solvers lost their minds because they trusted the calculating power of their brains at the expense of the mind's capacity for experience and its ability to learn from it. And John Dewey would have agreed. We will have truly globalized the undergraduate curriculum when our students develop the capacity at the end of their college experience to understand what it means to think globally. They need to develop both the positive comparative skills noted by Joe Stiglitz and the warning signals posited by Paul Krugman. They will then seamlessly incorporate an inter international perspective into their content knowledge and analytical processes. They will be internationalized to the extent that they think and act internationally. This is a huge challenge, and my argument is that it will not be met by exposing students to casual and unrelated international knowledge and experience. Going abroad and learning about other peoples and places will not suffice, although it might be a beginning for some and a capstone for others. We will only succeed if we can construct and maintain an intentional four-year effort to globalize and internationalize our students' minds. I think there are innumerable pedagogical strategies for achieving our goals, and I very much doubt that there is one best way. We will only know we have succeeded if and when we develop and deploy, of course, assessments of the extent to which our students can think and act uh, internationally, and I think we, uh, we very much need to do that. These are the questions that keep me awake at night, and I hope that some of them will worry you too. My plea uh, to the faculty colleagues here is simply to think beyond the good and useful work that you are already doing to, to internationalize the intellectual and life experience of your students, to think how they can be interrelated and how they can be expressed in a lifelong international take on life. How's that for an evening's challenge? Thanks very much. I'm sure there's a few questions. And so what I'm going to do, since it's a, we kept it in a small group, is just come to you if you have a question and hand you this mic, because it is being recorded. So, and, it, and I hope you don't mind a few questions. Okay, uh, someone? Yes. Professor Katz, you uh, talked about the, the two issues that's at stake here uh, more recently since, say, the global downturn in 2007. Do we teach internationally for the creation of jobs or do we teach internationally for um, the love of learning and, and, and uh, the uh, maybe more the existential. Are the two mutually exclusive? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> you, it, it's always an old friend who asks you a hard question. <laughs> obviously, uh, obviously they're, they're related. No, my objection is only to uh, uh, taking the sort of the, the easy, quick, and apparently uh, efficient way of preparing students for jobs, which is really to train them in very specific kinds of job skills. I don't think that's good for employers, and I don't think that's good for students. That's, that's really the only point I'm trying to make. But very often, that is the form. There's pressure for that. Sometimes it's from students, sometimes from parents, sometimes it's from employers. 
But we all know that if you speak to the people who uh, actually r run uh, human resources at large corporations, they do want, obviously, a certain level of skills that's terribly important. Um, but if they're interested in retaining employees over the long term, they really want employees who have both a range of skills, but more important, I think, the kind of maturity uh, and uh, intellectual uh, capacity that is going to serve them well over a long period of time. That's a simple-minded point to make, but I think it bears uh, reminding ourselves, particularly at a time like this where jobs are such a terrible problem. There isn't any doubt about that. But the fix isn't going to come from universities becoming job training centers. The fix is going to come by changing the economy, uh, and I'm not an expert on that subject. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Yes. It seems like you put a lot of the onus on teaching a global education on the professors, but at least as a student, my perspective would be that professors are very locked into their, their schools and that each department is very um, self-focused because that's how funding works. And I guess you work at a private institution, so I'm sure it's different, but it seems like at least from a student perspective, there needs to be more of an administrative support for the cross-pollination um, between departments. And I, I don't know how, I, don't, I guess I'm asking, um, are you addressing that on a higher level or just on the professor level? No, and on a, it needs to be your, that's a, thank you very much, it's really good, it's a really good comment. No, I mean, I think that um, it's always important for professors to be critical of professors to show that they're not immune from criticism, but we're not in this by ourselves. And a lot of the problems can't be solved either by individual professors or, more important, by individual departments, um, because we have, you know, we have very traditional categories of knowledge, which we call departments. Um, they tend to be focused and not to change very readily. And as new problems emerge, it's really important uh, to uh, work across those departmental structures, to develop new programs which are organized in different kinds of ways. And that's not going to happen without administrative support. Uh, you need the president, the provost, the dean to make those kinds of things happen. So absolutely. Um, uh, that needs to happen. It needs to happen, I think, uh, in its consortium of faculty with the administration. Most administrators are at least former faculty members, if not current faculty members. They, we don't have opposing interests, I don't think, at all. But it is a problem in any institution uh, to figure out uh, what it is you can afford to do in the institution. Resources are, are limited, obviously. And I think in a situation like this, I would say that uh, globalization and internationalization need, need to be near the top of the institutional agenda. And I would hope that the administrators would see that. And in a place like this, it's clear that they do. So thank you. It's a very good observation that you make. So building on that and recognizing that this is an impromptu answer you're going to give, if you were charged with creating a toolkit for administrators and you're going to put two things in the toolkit to better globalize the education, what two things would you put in the toolkit? Well, I mean, I think the, one of them is an easy one. Um, I'd put a lot of money in the toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> that would have... Every, everything is easier uh, uh, with money. Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, the other thing that needs to be there is the capacity to communicate with all aspects of the, of the uh, campus so that the kind of planning that can be done that really does understand what the strengths of the campus are in relation to the resources available so that the administrator can work with everybody else in the institution to focus the energies of the institution on what emerge as the priority problems. And I think what you've got right here, and it's clear that President Angstrom has identified the international sector, the global sector, as a very high priority. I think that's exactly right. And I think change is likely to come where you have a combination of commitment at the very top, as you have here, plus 
the uh, efficient and effective use of existing resources to achieve those ends. We'd all do better if we had unlimited resources, but even my outfit doesn't have unlimited resources, and you certainly don't have here. But uh, I think that is what you need. And I, I mean, I'm impressed, by the way, that the GLI is being funded by private donors. It's enormously important. I think it's also very clever. There's clearly something that is appealing to alumni and supporters of this institution, as it should be. So if you can ta tap into the imagination of your own uh, alumni and neighbors and you know, citizens of the state, I think that's great. But it requires a lot of leadership to make that happen. Thank you. Yes. This is a public institution and as such is somewhat beholden to a legislature which I think it's fair to say it has a somewhat adversarial relationship. Have you a suggestion or have you heard a, shall we say, a sales pitch to make a case for greater public support of global education to a legislature that uh, would pay off? Okay, well, that's a, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Let me start by saying, and I'll make this brief, but I think the business model for public higher education is broken. Um, there used to be a time when uh, the states as a whole contribute more than 50% to the annual budget of public institutions. The average now nationally is more like 15%. Uh, what that means is that institutions are more tuition driven than they were before, which means that uh, it's less and less possible to reach out to the kinds of citizens, young citizens in the state who most need public education. Uh, at the moment, I think that's the case that needs to be made to the legislature, is that the, the people of the state require better support of higher education. But I think it's also true, uh, here's where the practical ar arguments are important. I think, you know, to the extent that legislators care about uh, the economic well-being of the state and the prospects of the state in an increasingly global economy? Yes, uh, I think that's a good argument. Uh, to the extent the university is making contacts around the world, uh, is developing programs in consortium with important governments and institutions around the world, that ought in principle to be a winning argument with the legislature. At the moment it's not. Um, at least in most places, but legislatures both at the state level and at the national level are in a very mean mood, and it is hard to come up with purely rational arguments, I think, that are really effective in this environment, but that won't always be the case. And after all, you know, most legislators went to college. Uh, in a state like this, probably quite a few of them went uh, to uh, UM. Uh, and I think we have to uh, appeal to their sense of what's best for the state in an institution that's well managed and is truly preparing students for the 21st century. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that in the short term that's going to produce much, but I do think in the slightly longer term it might. But I think we're in a very tough place, and anybody who tells you he or she knows how to solve that problem is smoking something I don't have available to me. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Katz, towards the end of your talk, you uh, mentioned the need for a way of assessing uh, students uh, and their capacity right. to think globally. Do you have any thoughts on what would be involved in that assessment and a way of assessing the programs in? separate from assessing the students. So how do you know okay, well, it's GLI a real, is doing a good job? It's a really hard question. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a very brief answer. I, I think that there's a real um, need for us, in, uh, quite apart from international and global, to try to figure out what, if anything, our students are learning over four years. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with worrying about that. I don't have any doubt they are learning something. But what I'm in favor of is formative assessment. 
which is to say I think we ought to be assessing in an ongoing way and feeding that back into our actual program. So with respect to the GLI, I think you want to know which of these initiatives that you're just rolling out now are actually making a real cognitive difference to the students and what are the ways in which you could uh, improve that. Uh, I hope we will find more effective ways to do sort of outcome assessment at the very end to see what the total package means. There are a few CLA, there are a few assessments of that kind that have been developed now. I think they're not yet very good and I think we have to keep working at that. But that's a tough one because um, all too often uh, not so much institutions but faculty are very worried about that kind of assessment can be used badly. So it's a sensitive, uh, it's a sensitive subject. But I don't see why higher education faculty should be any less susceptible to assessment than K-12 faculty. Since I'm the head of assessment in this university, I think, <laughs> I'm going to actually end this because we have not fed our speaker. And uh, he does need dinner. So I appreciate everyone coming tonight. And thanks very much. <laughs>